Hey, toy and toy industry and fans of everything pop culture, welcome back to the Spectro Creative Channel. For the most part, this video, or rather, I'm sorry, this channel, does videos on things like how toys work and how to learn hieroglyphics and how to adore our cat, Kiki. And today I am going to still focus on how toys work, but I get a lot of questions about the legal issues of how toys work. And this can range from a lot of things. It can range from safety issues to contracts to likeness rights. And, well, I'm not a lawyer. But, fortunately, I know one. I know a great lawyer, and not only a great lawyer, but a toy lawyer. And, no, I, I, I don't mean like, you know, Jennifer and her alternate civilian identity as a lawyer. I'm talking about someone who handles the legal aspect of toys, and that's David Schneider. David is a graduate of Hastings University, and he's been in law practice for, well, a lot longer than I've even been making toys. And he's also, in addition to being an expert in law, he is a fanboy. He's a collector himself. So he brings a lot of energy, interest, and knowledge to questions about toys and the law. So he was nice enough to come on Spectre Creative, and I'm going to turn it over to him to talk a little bit about his experience and answering some questions that come up about toys and the law. It was 1980-something, the first night of Hanukkah, the night we always got presents. Like most boys growing up in the early 80s, Star Wars was everything. My brother and I used to jump on our beds listening to the Rebel theme song. We would set up our action figures and have epic battles on the floor. But everything changed that night. We would play on the floor no more, because that night, our loving parents gave us the X-Wing and TIE Fighter toys. For the next few months, much to our parents' chagrin, we would run up and down the halls having raging aerial battles and the occasional trench run down the long hallway. Back then, I never stopped to think about how those beautiful ships ended up in our hands. I never thought about the fact that Lucasfilm was a movie company, not a toy company. I was just thrilled to be living out my Star Wars fantasies with the action figures, vehicles, and playsets that made it possible. Some 40 years later, that same feeling I had as a kid is what motivates me to do what I do today. But now, instead of just playing with the toys, I help make them a reality. My name is David Snyder, and I'm a toy lawyer. Well, sort of. I'm a trademark and licensing lawyer, but that means I get to spend a lot of my time working with toy, collectible, and game companies. I help them with all kinds of legal issues, but my favorite part of the job is when I get to help them make the deals to develop products based on the characters and content we love. And I do that through the magic of licensing deals. See, companies like Lucasfilm or now Disney create wonderful content. They produce movies and TV shows with characters and vehicles that we love. But they don't make toys, clothes, lunch boxes, or any of the other merchandise that helps us connect with and experience those properties. Making a Mandalorian toy is far more complicated than just showing a manufacturer his picture and saying, go. It requires designers who know how to translate that picture into an articulable toy with proper scale and proportion. It takes overseas manufacturers who can develop and mass produce a product based on those designs. It takes sales reps and distributors to sell the products. It takes importing, warehousing, and logistical support to get those products into the stores. And it takes customer service to handle complaints, problems, or even fan support. Sure, a company like Disney could do all of that, but it's expensive, time-consuming, and risky for them to start a new business line. And for companies that don't have Disney's resources, it's not even possible. Instead, content owners seek out companies who are already experts at the products they make and grant those companies a license. So what is a license? A license is an agreement by a content owner to allow another company to use that content to provide a product or service. When Lucasfilm agreed to let Kenner make Star Wars action figures, Lucasfilm granted Kenner a license. 
When Batman appeared in Fortnite, that was a license. When you see SpongeBob on a lunchbox, that's also a license. The parties to a license agreement are the licensor and the licensee. The licensor is the party that owns the content being licensed. That could be a character, a story, a brand, or even artwork. The licensee is the party who is going to use the content to make something new. That could be t-shirts, backpacks, toys, or even new content like a TV show. In most licensing agreements, the licensor gives the licensee the right to use the licensed content on a specific product for a limited amount of time and in limited places. For example, in 2018, Warner Brothers granted Spin Master a three-year worldwide license agreement to make remote control toys using the DC heroes and villains. In exchange for the license, the licensee pays the licensor for the right to make the licensed products. The most common form of payment in a license agreement is a royalty on sales. That means that the licensee pays the licensor some percentage of the money it earns from sales of the licensed product. Royalty rates can vary quite a bit depending on the type of product being licensed, but they are usually in the 8% to 14% range for most consumer products. In addition to the royalty, most licensees have to pay an advance and a guarantee. The advance is an amount the licensee pays up front to get the license, but that it earns back out of the royalties. The guarantee is a minimum amount of royalties that the licensee must pay. The advance and guarantee are usually included for two reasons. First, they ensure that the licensor will earn enough money from the license to make it worthwhile. Second, they give the licensee incentive to sell at least enough licensed product to earn back the advance and guarantee they have to pay to the licensor. Let's go through an example to see how this works. Imagine that Apple has decided to grant McFarland Toys the right to make Ted Lasso action figures, and frankly, it's a travesty that they haven't done that yet. Apple might ask McFarland to pay a 10% royalty, to pay a $10,000 advance, and to guarantee $50,000 in royalties in the first year. As soon as it signs the agreement, McFarland has to pay the advance and is $10,000 in the hole. At a royalty rate of 10%, McFarland now must sell at least $100,000 worth of action figures to earn back that advance. But at the end of the year, McFarland still has to hit the guarantee. So if McFarland's total sales of lasso figures for the year are only $400,000, it will have paid $40,000 in royalties and will have to pay an additional $10,000 to hit the guarantee. But come on, everybody loves lasso. So let's say that McFarland sells a million dollars worth of figures. At a 10% royalty rate, it will have already paid Apple $100,000 in royalties and will have done what we call earning out the guarantee and will have nothing more to pay. You can see how this could be a great deal for Apple. Even if it turns out that we have misjudged the demand for a lasso figure and I'm the only person who buys one, McFarland still has to pay Apple the $50,000 guarantee. It's like free money, right? Sort of. What licensors risk is their brand. If the licensee makes a bad product or worse, a product that ends up hurting people, that can reflect poorly on the brand and diminish its value far more than what the licensor gets paid for the license. This could also be a really good deal for McFarland, right? If it sells a million dollars worth of figures, after paying Apple the royalty, it still grosses $900,000. That's why licensees take on these deals. But the licensee also bears a great deal of risk. It still has to pay out of pocket to design and produce licensed products. It has to pay the advance and the guarantee regardless of how the products perform. The licensee bears all the costs and all the risk, hoping that the licensed content is enough to drive high sales and make up for it. On top of just the usual risk of bringing any product to market, licensees also often have to deal with competition from other licensees. At least four different companies have licenses to make DC action figures. Sometimes licensees can get exclusive deals where the licensor agrees that they won't give anyone else a similar license. But most major studios won't grant exclusivity 
and will only say that they promise to only grant a single license. However, a common practice in recent years is something we call slicensing. Even if a licensor grants exclusivity, that exclusivity can be very limited. For example, one licensee might have exclusive rights to four inch figures, while another licensee might have rights to eight inch figures and yet another to 12 inch figures. Similarly, a studio might give rights to one company to make Halloween costumes and to another company to make cosplay costumes. In recent years, licensors has, have also started granting direct to retail licenses where they have one licensee for wholesale distribution, but will grant a separate license for the exact same product to a single large retailer for sale only in that retailer's stores. For example, a, co a company I worked with had a license to make Top Gun Halloween costumes, but Paramount granted a competing license to Spencer's to make its own Top Gun costumes to be sold only in Spencer's stores. But that means Spencer's was no longer buying the costume from the licensee I worked with. Given all of these risks, it's not hard to understand why lots of potential licensed products never see the light of day. In the 80s, I was a huge fan of the last Starfighter movie. I desperately wanted a gun star to play with. Galoob actually designed a line of action figures based on the movie. But when the movie failed to perform at the box office, it became too big a risk. Galoob decided it wasn't worth the cost of bringing the products to market because it didn't believe it could earn enough money to pay Universal and make a profit. For us collectors, that may be the most important point about licensing. There is no end to the types of products we would like to see developed based on our favorite stories and characters. But it has to make economic sense for the licensees to take the risk to make it happen. Not only does the content have to be popular enough to drive sales, but the product cost has to make sense. That's why life-size Grogu is one of the hottest commodities on the market, but you'll have a hard time finding a life-size Admiral Akbar. The good news for us is that as collectors have grown older, the licensing industry has grown with us. Overseas manufacturing, 3D printing, and other innovations have made it easier than ever to produce licensed products. As collectors have grown up and started earning disposable income, the interest in higher-end toys has grown. The internet has now made it possible for licensees to find a market for niche licenses and to make more esoteric products worthwhile. If you search hard enough, even those last Starfighter action figures are now out there for a price. I'm still waiting on my Gunstar, though. David, cannot thank you enough for coming on to answer all these questions. I know I feel more educated and more knowledgeable about the subject, and I imagine our viewers do as well. If you guys out there have other questions, especially questions that would go well for a toy lawyer, well, leave them in the comments below, and maybe we'll circle back and do a second episode like this. Again, huge thanks to David for coming on. I hope you guys enjoyed his, uh, his answers and perspective, and do share this video with others, because we love spreading knowledge. And you know, sharing it and liking it and subscribing to this channel helps tell YouTube to share it with others. It's, it's how their algorithm works. Thanks for watching.